Don't be afraid. It means that we can experience peace in the midst of a terrible situation because the peace is not the absence of something, but peace is the presence of someone, and that is God in our life. I am confronted with a terrible situation, but then God comes and He is crushing Satan where? Under my feet, under your feet. So it shows us that we are involved in the crushing. So God will give us the ability. He will give us the power. He will give us the courage. He will give us what we need so that we can, with His help, crush whatever is in our way. But I want you to know that God is with you in this situation. I am continuing preaching about the sermon series the God of signs and wonders. Today we are talking about the fifth sign that John talks about. And that is Jesus walking on water. And that is found in John chapter 6, verse 16 through 21. Okay. But before we go into that, I just want to tell you a little story. Since you guys seem to enjoy my stories, I just want to share a little bit more what God is doing, what God has done. We had a tremendous time at a leaders retreat last Sunday. So I want to thank all the leaders for coming. We had an awesome time and I really believe that God was doing something powerful and it will carry on and forward throughout the year. Amen. Amen. But you know what? I was thinking this wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't supposed to happen. This was not supposed to happen. Those were my thoughts over 20 years ago when I went to Angola. Just to give you a little story, I woke up on a Sunday morning, excited for church. I got ready, I went to church. There was a special Sunday because Berthold Klein, a missionary, an old friend from the church, was coming to our church. He was preaching about missions, especially in Africa and Angola. So I was ready to go and receive. I went excitedly to church, received the word. At the end of the service, he said he is looking for someone to take to Angola to help him with the mission work for about three or four months. Right after the service, I went straight up to him and said, you know what, I want to go. Pastor Berthold said, you know what, Stefan, nice and eager, but we have to talk to your parents. Because I never even talked to my parents. I went straight up to him. I said, I want to go. You have to talk to your parents. Okay, so I went back home. I talked to my parents. Thankfully, my parents let me go, even though I was only 18 years old. So we went to Angola, Africa. But before that, I had to go to the Tropical Institute in Frankfurt to get all my vaccinations for a yellow fever, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. I had to get all kinds of vaccinations. So I got all my vaccinations and the doctor gave me malaria pills that were supposed to be preventing for me to get any malaria. So I went to Africa, Angola, and every morning at the same time, I religiously took the medication that the doctor gave me exactly the way that he asked me to take it. At the time that he asked me to take it, I did everything by the book and I still got malaria three times. The second time when I got it, it was a really bad case. I was drifting in and out of consciousness. My body was pain and I felt pain like I never felt in my life before. It felt like every cell in my body was on fire. I was suffering. And I was thinking to myself, this was not supposed to happen. This was not supposed to happen. This was not supposed to happen. Isn't it interesting that sometimes storms come in our life? Maybe it was our fault. Maybe it's not our fault. Maybe it's our wrongdoing. Maybe it was our attitude. Or maybe it just so happened and it was not our fault at all. But reality is, storms will come in our life. And I'm sure that you figured out by now that I'm not talking about literal storms. 
I'm talking about figuratively storms coming in our life, situations that happen that we are just thinking this was not supposed to happen. Maybe you go to your job, you look at your career, you look at your working place, and you are thinking to yourself, this was not supposed to happen. Maybe you go and look at your bank statement, and you look at it and you think, this was not supposed to happen. Maybe you look at your children, and you're thinking, this was not supposed to happen. Maybe you're looking at your spouse, no, 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 no. <laughs> we won't even go there. But sometimes things happen in our life that we never anticipated. Things we never planned for. Things we never even thought possible. And they catch us off guard. And the thing is, as the storms come, they can also subside. Very often it comes and it's like overwhelming. But when we hang in there, just as fast they can disappear from our life. So I want you to know this morning that if you are going through a storm this morning, I want you to know that you will come out the other side of the storm. I want you to know that God is with you in that storm and that you can weather the storm and that you can come out the other side stronger than you went into the storm in the first place. I want you to know not to give up hope, but to believe that God is somehow still in control over your life. That in the situation that we might be going through, the situations that we don't understand, that God is still sitting on the throne and that he still has his authority in his hands. Amen? So we're going to talk about Jesus coming to the disciples in the middle of a storm walking on water. Like I said, it is found in John chapter 6, verse 16. But just to recap very quickly, we are talking about the signs that John is describing in his gospel. He said, I am taking these signs, and then he is not referring to them as miracles, but he's referring to them as signs because a sign is a miracle that conveys more information. I believe by now you have heard that, uh, me say that many times. So a sign is a miracle that carries more information. It is a miracle that teaches us a lesson. Or it is a miracle that points towards the miracle worker to God. So when John describes this miracle, he's describing how we can experience Jesus and God in our life. So John chapter 6, verse 16 through 21 says, if you have your Bibles, open up with me. If not, it's going to be up there on the screen. John chapter 6, verse 16 through 21. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake towards Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them, and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed for three or four miles, when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water towards the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, Don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him into the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. Now may God bless the, uh, add a blessing to the reading of his word. So I believe it is a very clear and short description of what happened here. Now if you go into Matthew chapter 14 and you go into Mark chapter 6, you see that Matthew and Mark give a lot more detail about the situation, but John keeps it very, very brief. Because, again, he, re, uh, he refers to this as a sign that Jesus did so that we can learn more about him. So he left completely out where Peter asked Jesus, if it's really you, let me walk on water. He left that part completely out. Even the part where Jesus made them go into the boat and go to the other side while Jesus went up into the mountain to pray, he left that one out. Because all that he wanted to show is how Jesus came to his disciples in the middle of a storm, helping and bringing salvation to the situation they were in. So we can learn that God is with us no matter what. 
But there are a few things I believe that really stand out. And I believe the attention of God rests with us if we show pers perseverance in our life. Perseverance. If you go into the dictionary and lo you look into perseverance, the noun, it is the persistent in doing something despite great difficulty. Doing something even though it is very hard to do, in other words. Now, if you look at persevere, the verb, the action word, then it says to continue in a course of action even in the face of difficulty with little or no indication of success. So perseverance or to persevere means that you keep on pressing in. That you don't give up. If we look into the scripture and we take into account Matthew and Mark, we know that the disciples were about three o'clock at night when Jesus walked on the water and came to them. That means that they were rowing in the storm for about six hours. Not just a little storm that just popped up here and then Jesus shows up at the scene. They had to row through the storm for about six hours before Jesus finally showed up. But what it shows us is that they had perseverance in their heart. And the first thing that we can really learn is that things will happen, but we have to keep pressing on. Bad things even might happen, but we have to keep pressing on. John chapter 6, verse 18, 19, it says, they had rode for three or four miles. Like I said, if you take into the other account, they were rowing against the storm for about six hours. That is a long time. But they were willing to fight. They didn't give up. They were giving their all. And just put yourself into the situation because sometimes we read the Bible already knowing how the story will end. We know that Jesus will come to them. We know that he walked on water, that he got into the boat, and the storm went quiet right away. We know that, but they had no idea. In fact, they were in the storm for many hours and they had little hope that something might happen. They were just trying to hang on, that they were just trying to survive. They were just trying to keep hanging on a little bit more at a time. But that is the kind of attitude I believe that gets the attention of God. If we, in our difficult situations that we might be going through, show perseverance, I believe we get the attention of God. That he cannot even help himself, but that he wants to come down and he wants to show up in our circumstances in our life. But we have to keep pressing in. And very often, just like the disciples, we might feel that a storm is outside of our control. That it is impossible to get through. That we have no control of bringing the storm to an end. But I want you to know, only because the storm is outside of our control, doesn't mean that it is outside of God's control. He is still in control. He still has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he still wants you to go through that storm. But he is with you every step of the way. And I know that God wants to show up. But we have to keep pressing in. We have to show perseverance. Now, when I was preparing for this, I believe this scripture uh, that came to me is very powerful. And I've never seen it really quite in that light before. But Romans chapter 16, verse 20. If you are going through a difficult situation, I believe this is the scripture for you today. Romans 16, verse 20. There it says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. May the God, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now if you go into the context of this, this is actually Paul writing to the church because there's teachers coming in who are teaching a false gospel and they're making it sound very attractive, very nice, so they're leading people astray. So P uh, Paul uh, writes this to the church and you can see how strongly he felt about the whole situation. But he said the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. But I believe it can be applied to our life. So now here's the question. Who is doing the crushing in this verse? Who is doing the crushing? 
God, the God of peace, will soon crush Satan under your feet. So God is the one who is doing the crushing, right? He is the one who gives power to crush the enemy. But here's my next question. Where does the crushing happen? Under our feet, under your feet. So God gives the ability. He is doing the crushing, but where does he do it? Under your feet. So if I read it in that context, it is not a picture that I am now confronted with a terrible situation. Then God comes in and he crushes whatever is in my way. And then I am here. It is crushed now. And then I can walk straight where I'm supposed to walk. That is not the picture that is given right here. The picture that is given, I am confronted with a terrible situation. But then God comes and he is crushing Satan where? Under my feet, under your feet. So it shows us that we are involved in the crushing. You and I, we have a part to play that God can use us to crush whatever is in our way. God is doing the crushing, but we are involved in the crushing. So we have to have the attitude and say, God, I want to persevere. I want you to come into my life. I need your help, but I am willing to do whatever it takes. So let me have the power to crush whatever is in my way. So God will give us the ability. He will give us the power. He will give us the courage. He will give us what we need so that we can, with his help, crush whatever is in our way. That shows that we are way more involved in the crushing than what we sometimes think. But God wants to use us, amen? He wants to work in our life, that we have that perseverance, that we have that tenacity to say, God, whatever it is, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go forward, because I know with you, everything else can be crushed that is in my way. Amen. When I was growing up in Germany, I remember that feeling of being helpless. And what happened was me and my cousins and my brothers, we went riding bicycle. We are in the village area, the kampong area. So we went basically riding every day in the summertime. So we were riding our bicycles and we went to the playground. Now the playground is in the middle of a hill going down. Up on the hill was my uncle's house. He was living there. Of course, a lot of other people as well. But in the middle, down the hill was the playground. And at the bottom of the hill was the old schoolhouse from that time. Now, of course, in my time, there was not a schoolhouse anymore. But my dad's time, it was still the school of the village. So my dad and all his friends, they used to go to that house, which is a cottage, a big cottage. And that was their school. But now, of course, it was sold over to somebody else, but there was no fence. So the hill goes down, and it goes right at the end. There's a road, but then there is the school that is at the end of the hill. So now me and my cousins, we were driving down with our bicycles, and at first we were going quite slow and carefully, but the more we got used to the hill and the slope, the faster we started to go. And then we started to race each other down the hill. And we went faster and faster. Now me and my cousin, we were a bit competitive. So we went riding down the hill. And when we approached down where there was the the road and then the school property, I knew there's no way that I can stop in time. And I look over. My cousin is just as fast as me. He also must have realized there's no way that we can stop in time. Now, down at the end of the road, the property that was there, there was a big field that was filled or invested with a burning nettles, they call it in German, which in the English I checked, it was the stinging nettles, which is almost like poison ivy. So when I was coming down, I realized there is no way that I can stop. So when I was looking over at my cousins, he also realized, so he started to try to slow down. And I was thinking to myself, you know what, I'm not going to slow down because there's no way that I can stop in time. So I sped up a little bit more, hoping that I would get through to the other side of the field. So I went through the the whole field of the burning nestles, and I made it to the other side. 
but my, my arms and my legs, because I was wearing shorts, my arms, my hands, my legs were full of blisters. Because when you go through, there's fine hair, almost like thorns on the plant that cut your skin and it leaves the poison in your skin and it becomes like rashes and becomes like boils and it is burning quite badly. So I made it to the other side. My cousin, <laughs> my cousin he, didn't, he wasn't so lucky, so he stopped about halfway through the field and he fell over. Boom. So now, not only had he on his legs, on his arms, on the hands, his whole face, his neck, down where the shirt was, everything was covered in blisters. And it was burning. And he came out screaming. <laughs> he was screaming. But I still remember going down the hill, realizing there is no way that I can stop in time. That feeling of being helpless, not knowing what to do because no matter what, if I try to make a turn, I will fall. There is all this gravel. I will fall. I will scratch up my leg. It's terrible. If I go straight, I know what's going to happen. So there was no good solution. But very often that is what happens in life. We all of a sudden come to a situation where we are all of a sudden confronted with something and it seems like there is no way out. I am helpless. I cannot do anything. I can just watch it unfold in my life. But I want you to know that God is with you in this situation. Amen. Even though we might feel helpless with God, we can come out at the other side stronger than we keep in. So keep pressing in. Don't give up. Make sure that you reach the other side of the field, the other side of the storm. Then don't get caught in the middle of a storm and just lie down in resignation and just say, maybe this is just what life is now. No, press in. Because I believe God will bring you through the storm. Amen? So keep pressing in. Number two, fear not. Keep your cool. John 6 verse 20 says, But he called out to them, Don't be afraid. Now think about that. That is a, a statement where you think, Why would Jesus even say that? Well, first of all, it's right here in the text, Because they were terrified. So when Jesus shows up, he says, don't be afraid. But also, we also see that when Jesus asks his disciples in a terrible situation where they were fearing for their life, don't be afraid, that means that it was possible for them to experience peace in the midst of a terrible situation. Because Jesus would not ask his disciples something that was impossible, so when Jesus came to them in a terrible situation that was terrifying, but he tells them, don't be afraid. It means that we can experience peace in the midst of a terrible situation. And that is when we have Jesus with us. That is where the peace really comes from. Amen? That we know that God is with us in the middle of the storm. It doesn't mean that we will never face terrible situations. It doesn't mean that our life will go nice and happy-go-lucky, that everything will fall our way, that everything will go nicely. It means that even in the midst of a terrible situation, we can expect God to give us peace. Because the peace is not the absent of something, but peace is the present of someone. And that is God in our life. Amen? Very often, just simply the presence of God can make all the difference. Even the situation did not change immediately. Just them seeing Jesus coming gave them hope already and hopefully brought a little bit calmness to their nerves. Where they were so terrified before that they said, Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Maybe that helped them a little bit. Now, I believe they were so terrified because at that time, a lot of people died on that lake, the Lake of Galilee. So what actually, if you look at the geography of the Lake of Galilee, the Lake of Galilee is actually 700 feet below sea level. And at the side, at least three sides of the lake, there are mountains coming up to about 4,000 feet. So what happens now, especially in the evening, the cold air from the, from the top is blowing against the mountains and then is being redirected down into the valley and it sweeps over the lake. 
And there it starts to mix with the warm and moist air of the lake, and it creates almost like a whirlwind and a mighty storm. So the, the problem was, very often you could not even see the storm coming. Because it was not dark clouds and then lightning and thunder and then the storm was building up. It was something you couldn't even see. The cold wind came against the mountains, went down over the lake, started to swirl with the warm wind that was on the sea, and it created a terrible storm. So very often people were caught off guard and many drowned and died in that lake. So their belief was at night when there was a storm that those who died on the lake would come and haunt and pull the other sailors down and they would die on the storm as well. So when they, and that is, we find that in Matthew and Mark, when they thought he was a ghost, that is what everybody was talking about. That they were scared that there was a ghost going around, killing people in the storm, pulling them underwater and drowning them. So now when they saw Jesus, they did not even realize it was him. But Jesus was coming to them, but they did not even realize. I wonder how often God is showing up in our life and we don't even notice him. We mistake it for something else. Maybe we take it for granted. Maybe we don't even realize, but we have to be more aware that God is there. Where he said, don't be afraid. I am here with you. God is with us every step of way, even if we don't uh, see it right now. Even if we are not aware of it, we can be assured that Jesus is with us. Amen? But we have to come to a place where we say, God, change my heart. Change my attitude. That I will not be consumed with fear, but that I can experience peace in my life. And we are not into behavior modification. That is something that I saw on social media last week. We are not into behavior modification because that is religion. Religion tells you all the do's and the don'ts. All the things that you can do. All the things that you are not supposed to do. And so we are trying to modify our behavior to keep all the rules. But that is religion. Whereas what we are after or God is after, he is after transformation. And that is we can find in Romans 12 verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The first one, conforming to a pattern, that is religion. But God is after transformation of our mind. Because once our mind is transformed, our actions, the way that we see things, the way that we perceive things, the way that we live our life will also be changed. So we need to let God come in and change us from the inside out. So don't be afraid. God is with you in the storm. Number three, very quickly. You are not alone. Keep believing. John 6 verse 20, but he called out to them, don't be afraid, I am here. Jesus said, I am here. Now, of course, if we think logically about this, that time Jesus was physically with them right there. He got into the boat, the, the, the storm died down, and they were all happily together. But how is that possible practically today? And that leads me to my next question. Where do you think Jesus is right now? If you look into the Bible, Romans 8 verse 34, we know that God is, uh, that Jesus is now exalted at the right hand of the Father, doing what? Interceding for us. So Jesus is now up in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and he is interceding for us. So we know that Jesus is ever so interceding for us, and that he is uh, praying for us, but how can we experience him realistically? Through the Holy Spirit. Come on. Whenever we feel God move, that is the Holy Spirit. Whenever we feel a tuck on our heart, that is the Holy Spirit. Whenever we feel convicted of something that we are doing in our life, that is the Holy Spirit. So whenever we see God moving in our life, that is actually the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we can also see in John chapter 14 verse 6. Here Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Another translation says he will give you the helper to help you and he will be with you forever. 
So we are experiencing the peace of God when we have the Holy Spirit with us. Whenever God is moving, that is actually the, the moving of the Holy Spirit. So we need to have more of the Holy Spirit. And if you are at all interested, I urge you to join the Bible study every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock on Zoom because we are talking right now about the Holy Spirit. There is so much more that we can learn from the Holy Spirit, so much more that we have to understand. And I believe last week Pastor David uh, 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 said at the end of the service that the heritage of Assemblies of God is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is the moving of the Holy Spirit. And we have to come back to that heritage to get God more involved in our life. I will finish with this one. In Germany, every year, we would have a street crusade because we are a lot more free to do street crusades in Germany rather than here in Malaysia. So once a year, the church youth would come together, we would uh, practice some songs and some dances, and we would go out on the streets, and then we would perform the songs, we would play music, then we would uh, do the dances, and then people would start coming and looking and watching what is going on, and then we were looking around, looking at people, and then we would go up to them and start talking to them about what they have just seen, uh, if they're interested in coming to church, trying to witness to them, all these things. So, but the thing is, very often when I was talking to people, all of a sudden there was a person where I could feel I was drawn to that person. Where I all of a sudden knew, and you know what, I was having a good conversation here, but I was just drawn to that person. And I believe that was the Holy Spirit. And that is the, the way that the Holy Spirit wants to work in our life. He wants to be actively involved in our life. But very often we are so busy with our everyday life that we don't even realize that the Holy Spirit is giving us direction. That He is pulling us here or that He is prompting us to do something or that He wants us to do here something. But we are so busy that we are completely unaware of it. It's time that we give God more room in us so that Jesus, like He was with the disciples in the storm, so that we have the Holy Spirit with us, and that He can lead us and guide us, and that He can use us in a powerful way. If we really want to see growth in our life, we need the Holy Spirit. If we want to see growth in our family, that they get serious about God, our children, that they'll grow up in the ways of God, we need the Holy Spirit. If we want to see people added to the church, we need the Holy Spirit. Everything comes back to the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have to make room for Him to really come and work in each and every one of our lives. Amen. Jesus gave the promise, I am with you. I believe we have the same promise in the Holy Spirit. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. He will always be with us. Amen. Let a praise team come this morning. Let's rise to our feet and respond to God in prayer.